This is Kettering University. It, it truly is a pleasure to be back at Kettering. And it's also a pleasure to be here with uh, familiar faces that I have met at so many other places. So this is, this is a treat for me. And as I, I look at so many people, I'm thinking, if I do a really good job with this topical grant keynote speech, I'm going to generate a lot of reading material from each of you. <laughs> so, and I hope to. I hope to. Yeah, I hope the goal today is that we end up uh, at a position that really moves the Keen program forward and not just forward at one institution, but forward together at many institutions. And so th it's a thrill. I'm really glad that uh, you made the trip. I'm glad that you've stepped out of class and out of your regular routine uh, at Kettering as well as other places to, to join today. So I, I, have, uh, I appreciated Robert's uh, story about uh, travel problems, and I'm going to make an excuse right up front. So I'm in, I'm in Chicago O'Hare, uh, just uh, yesterday, a guy's belt gets stuck on the conveyor at the screening station. This, this uh, belt is stuck and, and he's having a hard time getting it. I reach around and I help get this and, and kind of then all the baggage just kind of goes through and gets on down the line. And the guy behind me is congratulating me for my great work. I put my bags on, I walk away thinking I've done a good job, but I left my laptop at the screening station. <laughs> yes. So, so what I've done is uh, what I've done is put together a presentation that has a few issues with it. Uh, starting about last night is when I made this discovery. So I look in my bag and say, "Oh yes." <laughs> so I've I've got a couple of issues with my presentation. So just give me a little grace. There's a few font issues and things like that. And, uh, and also, if you have some, any, any instruction on extemporaneous speaking, I am very receptive to that at this moment. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's get started. So this is a workshop. Let me even frame what, uh, what this is about. This, this workshop uh, is a workshop that we put on at a fall meeting. We convene the Keen Schools twice a year. Usually in the fall, near the end of September, we ask all the PIs and maybe one or two other people to join in Milwaukee. And so we get a group of about 60, 65 people uh, to join, join us in Milwaukee, and we go through uh, kind of things that have to do with grant activity. And in fact, the goal of the meeting there was to actually increase networking. So we had a format that was, that was designed to increase the networking between the schools. And that, that, I think, was very successful. Prior to that meeting, we had a, a topical grant half-day workshop. And so that's, that's where some of the material that you're going to see today was pulled together and kind of uh, Frankenstein together, if you will. So hopefully it it's, uh, resembles very, very, it's very similar to, to what was done at that topical grant workshop. I think that workshop kind of laid the ground and the, the idea for the PIs to go back to their institutions and take some of these, these uh, topical grant ideas and say, here's, here's what these guys are talking about. Here's what the foundation is looking for. So it was sort of a train the trainers, send the people back with the message. Masood had the idea of, of getting the group together at a regional conference to do this, and I think it's a great idea. So, so that's where this presentation comes from. Okay. First thing I, I want to do is frame this. I think the right thing to do for the group, and a group so intellectual, <laughs> is to make sure that, that there's a clear idea of why we created these, in addition to just saying, here's the nuts and bolts of this. I want you to know why these exist and how they fit in with the rest of the things that we're doing. So let me kind of start off in that way. Uh, I grabbed a picture here of your students in your classroom. <laughs> and in this picture, you know, we've already answered that question, who else is in the room? So 
I pretty much know the audience that's here. And this is what your students often think when they get into class, I suppose, maybe the first time. And they're looking at uh, what you're presenting and what the goal, what is the goal of this? So let me tell you, the goal of this is today that you end up with kind of a seed idea. As Masood said, at the end of the workshop, the designers of the workshop, Masood, Gurma, Mo, have, have uh, kind of put a strategy together so that at the end of the day, you've got something, to, a takeaway, at least a seed idea. And if not that, you at least have a great understanding of what it would take to write a topical grant proposal. And so that's the goal today. So you can see some of the font issues that I already have. The rest of the, the, the phrase up there is, why do I care? Well, the, and that, your students ask that, right? The, and the why do I care question for, for institutions like yours, one of the things we were looking at, or I, I felt particularly uh, interested in, was where is the leverage point at institutions? Where, where do you, when you work with an institution to try and create change, where do you work? Well, we've got so many faculty members, you might naturally say faculty members, but if you were a group of administrators, you might naturally say administrators. And where do you work? What, I think the leverage point, though, at an institution, particularly those that are faculty governed and so on, really is the faculty members. So that made me rethink, and that's really where the origin of these topical grants came from. Why do I care? I think there's an interesting opportunity here that's not very common at a lot of private institutions that are teaching focused. So I think this, what we've got to share has a unique opportunity, fairly unique opportunity. All right. So the purpose, guidelines, process. Examples and proposal kit. Some of these things will come throughout the, the rest of the, the workshop. And so again, I just want to frame this. So first of all, why do we make grants? We basically want to work toward the mission and vision of the Kern Family Foundation to create undergraduate engineers with an entrepreneurial mindset. Okay? And the rest of the phrase, if you look at our mission, is to transform the U.S. workforce. What a tremendously large mission and vision that's, that's been established by Robert Kern, Robert and Patricia Kern. Transform the U.S. workforce. If you start thinking about what that will take, it's a little bit daunting, particularly if you're in my role and you're, you're trying to figure out how do we do that. It's many years worth of work. It's many years ahead of us in, work, in terms of work. So a lot of what we're doing today is laying a foundation. You'll see that the, as we get into more of the purpose of the topical grants, you'll see how they are so important, maybe not just to you and your individual interests, but to a foundation that's going to get uh, laid and kind of builds something to build upon. You'll see that as we discuss the purpose. But these certainly fit into the uh, mi vision and mission of the Kern Family Foundation. The other reason to make the grants is to accelerate the work. You know, the, if you have kind of kept your finger on the pulse of what's happening in entrepreneurial engineering, you would see that all across the nation there's a lot of work going on. And it is, it is certainly occurring. You know, we, there are groups that are uh, been established that actually there's a few groups that look very similar to Keene these days. There's certainly a lot of incubator activity. There's certainly a lot of uh, 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 kind of arms of institutions that are being built to, to drive the economy locally, usually established by economic development commissions. There's all sorts of things that are kind of getting mixed in with the university. Our goal is to accelerate this work in a very specific way. And so what the funding does to, I, I believe the work would actually naturally happen. What the funding does is just simply speeds it up and helps direct, direct it. So that's, why, that's the way we look at this. And the goal of the funding is to create kind of a, a self-sustaining practice. That you, most of you may know about the Kern Family Foundation's uh, plan for, for sunsetting in 2035. Some of you may not know that. What that allows us to do is to spend the corpus of this, the, the, the foundation's assets at a rate that's 
accelerated because we're spending, spending down the base as well. That lets us fight up a weight class, basically. And it provides a lot of resources. And the other, you might wonder, why would a foundation do that? Why wouldn't they just exist in perpetuity and just work off of the interest gained on, on investments on the base of the foundation? The reason is very simple. The reason has more to do with not fighting up a weight class. It has more to do with the mission and, and accomplishing this with a sense of urgency and without losing focus after generation, generation, and generation of the family foundation might continue. The, when, when Robert Kern established the foundation, he looked at the, uh, the patterns of foundations that existed for long periods of time and recognized that to be on course and on focus, this is his favorite gesture, quite frankly, to be focused, that uh, that would require a uh, sunset foundation. And so the implication is exactly what you see up on the screen as the last bullet. If we're out of business and we shutter the doors in 2035, we hope to have made a legacy difference and, and created something that's self-sustaining. So that really has uh, back to the building a base of, of material and teaching resources and thought on this topic is, is core to our mission. So my, some of my uh, visuals up here are, are a little bit, admittedly, a little bit goofy. Uh, so if you just think of that like the balloon, this is, this is kind of, the funding is kind of uh, a lift, if you will. You'll, you'll see this balloon come up here again in a minute. I want to tell you about the types of grants that we have. Okay? The, when I arrived at the foundation, we only had one type of grant, and that type of grant was called an institutional grant. A grant was made to the institution at large. Of course, there was a PI, or principal investigator, associated with it. And that PI was charged with basically executing that, but really the view was that was an institution's grant. Now, that's great. Administrators tend to love that. Uh, faculty members could get benefits from that. But it, one of the challenges that I recognize is this doesn't build a faculty member's CV. And so, why not be a little more direct to customer, if you will, if we believe that faculty is the leverage point? So we created this uh, category called topical grants, the second category up there. And that's the focus of today's meeting. Uh, just to kind of completely tell the story, we created one more category called small group grants. Some of you know about those, some don't, but these Quite frankly, there it's it's almost uh, it's very small funding, but we've got a great return on investment. I've been really impressed with what's been going on with these small group grants. Small group grants are fifteen hundred dollars, and what they do is they establish something like a book club or a movie club, so that there's some discussion and so there's some shared thought that's directed along certain lines. For example, you get a group together and you watch something like Apollo thirteen. And you go, okay, persist and learn through failure. And kind of figure out how do some of these keen topics play into that particular movie. So as long as it's a movie and there's a coupled discussion with it, that turns out to be what the small group grants tend to do. We, they've been more frequently used for book studies where people will say, I really like the book about the whole new mind, or I like this particular book, and we advocate a few particular materials. But those have been, I won't say anything more about that, so I'm going on a little bit with the detail. Those have been uh, a great return on investment because we can execute those so easily. And, uh, and I would encourage you, if your institution has not done a small group grant, it's something we're ex we've experimented with and it's been successful. I want to do more of these. It's, it's a one pager so, and it's a quick turn. That's all I'll say about small group grants. Topical grants are really the topic here. Okay. A little bit more detail. I guess I do have a couple more details about the, each of these. The institutional grants, when you make a grant to an institution, the, the goal there is to get 50% of the faculty engaged on a regular basis. 
That means delivering courses, perhaps engaged in co-curricular, extracurricular, administrative, something. 50% of the faculty is a fairly high aspirational goal. Well, I would say it's not just an aspirational goal. It's really, a, it is a target that we try to measure. We ask people to self-report. How are your faculty involved? Who's teaching what? And so part of the institutional grant is a lot of reporting, and, but we try to assess whether we're meeting that or not. The other thing that comes along with an institutional grant is, as you probably know, is that it involves you in the Keen network. And so those conferences that I mentioned, fall meeting, and I didn't talk much about the winter conference, but those are activities where, where people get together and share ideas, and network participation is an aspect of this as well. And so because of the network participation, you always end up with cross-disciplinary work, intercollegiate work, and so on, that come out of the institutional grants. And again, that fourth bullet, culture change and sustainability, uh, those are the goals. And I won't belabor the bullet points here anymore, but that's the institu institutional grants. The next one, since we're going to focus on topical grants, I'll just put the bullets up there about small group grants. The goal there is to create a meaningful dialogue about these topics. Um, again, it's kind of pizza money. It's a little better than pizza money. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of pizza. Sushi. <laughs> Sushi bunny. Okay. So, you know, it's been a, something that, that has been important to building this foundation is create this shared collection of resources. Now, everybody in engineering and sciences would acknowledge that very few things are done on an individual basis these days. It's usually collaborative in some ways. At some point, it turned, there's an individual work, and certainly you do that. But at some point, to really create value, there's something that collaboratively happens. And, and I think that collaboration, as it applies to topical grants, is that we create teaching resources that become useful for each other. In fact, if you're going to create a teaching resource, if Masood says, I want to create a teaching resource, and he tells the foundation that, that's not, I'm not convinced until the rest of you say, or at least a subset of you say, I really want what he's doing. I want to know that there's a market for that. So it's really a pro applying our process. And so this shared collection of resources that assist others, by virtue, to have any value, it has to be desired by the group at large. And so there is a collaborative nature in just kind of this, this existing market of people that are providing education. And, and we want to have that particularly directed and aligned with the goals of the the Kern Family Foundation, that it's not just some teaching resource. You can't just say, I want to do flipped classrooms. It's got to be flipped classrooms for something that the foundation is interested and in, aligned with. And so that's one of the things that I need to convey through our message today is, what are we talking about in terms of alignment? What hits our bullseye? Okay? So that's, that's one of the goals that we'll go through. We'll get that done. The other thing that I, I, I recognized is uh, these topical grants were created. I want to point out the second bullet. The topical grants were created because I really want to attract faculty members to this who are entrepreneurial themselves. So they're not only educators, but they say, I've got, I, I want to build an, inter I want to enterprise a little bit and pursue a grant that's much different than getting an institutional grant and then being assigned tasks to complete. So that's one of the reasons why we're soliciting proposals directly from faculty these days. The last bullet up there, I'll come back to this time and again. The last bullet is that we are building this library and you don't just get all your books in one category. So I have a strategy 
back at the foundation in Wisconsin to to flesh this library out in some way where I can see oh, we're building in this area, but I have a gap over here in this area. And I have a gap maybe in civil engineering that has to do with regulatory requirements. And so it'd be nice to have something there. And so I, I, when we're looking at this, I want you to understand that, that there's a, we're trying to, to uh, at least strategically select grants. Now, you might say, if we're going to write our, if we're going to put our uh, skin in the game and write a topical grant, how do I know where you're selecting right now, Doug? So I will try to speak to that, and that'll be some of some of what we do. But I want you to understand also that that uh, our process right now certainly does end up with with proposals that are not awarded, and there's a variety of reasons for that. And we'll talk about those. One of them that's obvious from the last comments I made, certainly that it may not fit a current strategy or might not be in our current timeline. It might be as simple as that. So, all right. So if you talk about balloons, <laughs> the institutional grant is designed to change the culture of the entire institution you know, basically injecting funds that lift the entire institution, if you will. You know how hard it was to find a hot air balloon that looks like a donut. <laughs> <laughs> the small group grants, a bunch of little activities, okay. You just get a bunch of people talking in the same direction. And uh, this is something that I think would be interesting to try, but I've read about this. This is more dangerous than hot air ballooning. I have tried to go hot air ballooning three times this year, and I don't know, it might be like my trip through the Chicago or Air Airport. Maybe I just shouldn't do that. <laughs> Every time we try to go, it, it rains. So, the topical grants are like this. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a tank built out of these balloons. Very strategic, we're trying to pick particular things that, that really hit and, you'll, and result in something very tangible, codifiable, shareable, certain attributes that we'll go through. All right. Here's the guidelines. So the guidelines for a grant are usually kind of, here's what's typical. Guidelines for our grants are usually deliverables and we have specific deliverables uh, that, that are negotiated between the foundation and the faculty member, but we intend the timeline to be somewhere around three to 12 months. So they're rapid as far as most people are concerned. It's not the two-year process or three-year process. Our institutional grants, and I don't know, maybe the font cut it off, the institutional grants are typically about three years in length. And they're, you know, large dollars that go to an institution. Topical grants are or let's get this done and let's get this in the can and let's get some people trying something. Prototypes are better than perfection. Award amounts are typically from 8K to 40K. Um, that's sometimes, that's sometimes, quite frankly, that's not a lot of money to do some of the work that we have seen get done. So some people are able to stretch, stretch that and work with multiple people, three or four people, working on, say, 140K grant. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a wealth, it's, it's, but it's, it's entrepreneurial. You work with your resources, produce as much as you can, and so on. So 8K to 40K is the typical award amount. Now the PI for that particular grant, right now, the PIs need to be from a keen institution, and everyone here is, so there's no issues there, but just so you know that the scope is actually wider. One of the things that I'm doing at the winter conference is, I want to see that conference not be a keen conference. You're the first to probably hear that phrase. I don't want that winter conference to be a keen conference. I want it to be an entrepreneurially minded learning conference that attracts all sorts of people. Ultimately, hopefully students might even go to this, have posters and papers. This would attract a broader set outside 
of the key network and you know a mix of, of ideas because there there is not one currently that exists there's an opportunity there and I think there's important work to be done right now Keen forms that conference and we have as of last year invited a lot of outside schools we had uh, 10 extra institutions 10 outside institutions outside the Keen network attend our last winter conference so that's, that is part of building that conference so that it's about entrepreneurially minded learning. Our fall meeting is about Keen. Just so you start. Well, if you've attended a Keen conference, if you've, attended a, if you've attended a winter conference, then those individuals, just so you know, are eligible to submit a grant as well because it's, it's a starting point. To have that idea of alignment with the Keen principles, you have to have a starting point. So that's why the requirements there. Yeah. Question. Yeah, please. And by the way, uh, this should be more dialogue than we've had so far. So uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you would. So you have in January Florida meeting, right? I it, January third and fourth is the upcoming winter conference. And who is that conference? I will not be able to go there. Can I send one of my undergraduate student? to present their project kind of thing. So that's a, so they're mentioning that the student can come and share their experience with that. At, at this particular conference, we are still aiming at administration and faculty. Oh, okay. so what I described is probably a migration to the future. Oh so this, this coming winter conference is still focused, I would say, it's still very keen centric. And because of that, I, I'm not suggesting students this particular time. So I'm glad you asked the question. That helps clarify that. Yeah. So after uh, the completion of the project, that was say for a month, uh, can API extend or reapply for a new grant or? Uh... Absolutely. Yeah. Could and, and in parallel with your question, could a person have two at the same time? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the so the question uh, the question was about can a uh, PI reapply and have a second grant, or could they have a parallel grant? The answer to both questions is yes. Yeah. Now, on this uh, one of the policies with Family Foundation is no overhead. And so the budget should not include overhead, and it shouldn't include fringe benefits. Overhead is usually not a problem. Most, most, uh, most offices of sponsored research understand that, by and large, when they work with foundations, particularly fam family foundations, overhead is waived because you're going to keep the lights and building on anyway. Fringe benefits is a different issue. Fringe benefits, you know, if you... If, you, uh, if part of your proposal includes a stipend or includes some overload or something for, for the people that are doing the work, whether it's yourself or someone else, fringe benefits have to get paid. Typically those, you know, those range from 25 to 32, 30, 35%. 30% 30 is a very common number. Those fringe benefits uh, have to come from somewhere, but they won't come from the foundation. That is our uh, approach to getting the institution's skin in the game. So usually those fringe benefit funds have to come from a department, from a provost, from, from some sort of funding source that, that, uh, that can put that together. I would like to share here my, our experience for the grant. Yes. What happened, we got the grant with the collaboration with the Gonzaga, St. Louis, and the Northern Ohio. After the grant, I got approval with that overhead and French issue from Lawrence Day. They made it clear, okay, you can go ahead. But we did not get formal approval from those three schools. After we received grant, then all copies had a little bit hard time from the research support service offices, research, yeah. Offices, they don't want to, they want to charge overhead, they want to charge friends benefit, they send email to our provost, how to deal with it, and they were looking for the announcement. 
your call for proposal they could not find that information it was a little bit trouble situation it took about 2 3 2 to 3 months for each school to resolve it but if we put that information on part of your announcement then all schools in school would be gr2 and okay. so that kind of thing then it was a little bit beginning it got a little bit hassle but all cleared out smoothly so, so first, i would like to share my share my experience so to, uh, that's that's very helpful, and I'll, I'll summarize that comment so that it gets gets recorded. That uh, we will put this uh, this comment if it's not currently in some of the documentation that is in the call for proposals. We need to put that in there because I've recognized the same thing. Offices of sponsored research are usually reactive to the policies and procedures set by foundations. So as long as they're specified, they they can work with that. Uh, but at the same time, you as the entrepreneurial faculty member have to figure out where those funds are going to come from. But uh, that's, that's just part of that, this process. Any, any other questions or comments on that? Yes. Can you give an example of what fringe benefits should not be there? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with this. Oh. So we are not talking about uh, the pay of the faculty who do the work. No. So in, say, say somebody has uh, submitted a proposal for $30,000. And in that $30,000, they said, I need this equipment, I need this, and I'm going to pay myself $10,000. Typically, with that self-pay of, of $10,000 for the work, because it goes through the institution, the institution has to pay you associated French benefits, which would just be, um, what would they be comprised of? Yeah, TIA, AA CRAF, all of those typical things. Yeah, all, all of those things they quite often amount to about 30 percent so it would probably be a three thousand dollar bill okay, that you would have to get covered through something okay. the good news we say matching's not required now you might consider fringe benefits as part of a match but but in general matching is not required so we're not looking for you to go out and find external gifts in kind or anything else to bring. In. We, this is, and the reason for that is because we don't want the, the time delay that's associated with that. Uh, we want you to be able to execute as quickly as possible. So matching is not required, even though you might consider it. Uh, some people, even though we put this stipulation in, will take advantage of the fact that they're seeking a proposal to go to a company or to go to somebody else and say, you know, this would be, uh, a, they, they basically work both sides, which is the right thing to do. And, and they say, you know, I, I would, if I do this, maybe company you would support me. And so they, I still see matching showing up uh, in various forms. And that is attractive, quite frankly, that's, that's still attractive. Uh, but it is not required. So, marketing is required. You know, when I was saying you have to make sure, you have to make certain that other people want what you're doing. This is actually, this is one of my favorite aspects of this whole process. <laughs> is because if somebody wants to create a teaching module around circuits, okay, something that that would be interesting to me and that, because I love the idea of getting down to some of the core discipline type of topics. And teaching around circuits. Well, I better figure out first if the other faculty in my department uh, believe that what I'm proposing as a module, if they would adopt and use it. And if they do, I would like to see a letter of endorsement of, of some sort. Maybe they even join and partner with you at that point. Maybe it's simply a collegial letter of support. But even better than that is getting support outside your school because I, even, I, I understand and appreciate how doing it inside the school could be a challenge. You might want to pursue, uh, because we have the network established, how, somebody that's at another institution that's teaching circuits and you say, would you use this? And then at some points, uh, Ahad will talk a little bit more about, about his proposal and his grant award. Uh, but at some point, there might even be an exchange. Maybe that person says, well, I, I want to do this too, and then we'll switch. Question. Yes. Would it be helpful to have letters of support as well from companies or institutions that would potentially hire people with the skills that would be developed? 
develop through whatever you're developing? It is, and I, I do get those. Uh, the, the question is, would it be helpful to, to have letters of support from companies uh, that might be hiring these students or from kind of, um, what, what, what else, Diane? Um, companies, institutions, somebody who would be the market for the students beyond the institution, okay. beyond the university. Somebody that's a market for the for the students beyond the university. Uh, yes, it, w it is. It is. Uh, it's attractive to have those letters, but it's not exactly about building that base of educational tools. So those letters, while important, are not the tipping point. I would say. Okay. Okay. So. The, the point up here, endorsement or planned usage does strengthen proposals, particularly if you've really made a significant effort to get that outside of your institution. In this seat. So the established channels such as the, adding a chapter in the book that's, that's widely adopted by different schools, uh, that would be pre-done pre marketing. Do you agree? Yeah, and I'll, I'll repeat that. So uh, uh, adding a chapter in a book that uh, uh, the marketing that's already accepted, the, if the book's already accepted, that would be marketing that's already been done. Yeah, yeah that, would, that would be, you could certainly make a case for that. I'm looking for any case where there's, a, there's an obvious receptivity by other people and that it's, it's going to have some life beyond just your office and your classroom. So the process. So here's the way this goes. We review the purpose and guidelines. Uh, so I would ask you to review the purpose and guidelines. We're going to do that fairly quickly in, in a few moments here. We'll turn to that process. Um, and I'll show you that's how you hit the bullseye. That first piece is making sure that your grant kind of fits uh, some of the goals of Keene. Uh, develop and submit a proposal. We review these things on a quarterly basis, and so that uh, there's a schedule. Uh, I'll share with you in a few moments the next cycle. If you would like, yeah, Pat. I think my font is cutting off something. <laughs> something here. I think it's the Keen website and some of the materials that I'm going to distribute. So I'm a little bit handicapped. I was trying to remember what that was because I, I caught the same thing. It's like, review Keen, what does that mean? <laughs> it's, it's the materials that I'm going to distribute here in a minute. Okay. Um, if you'd like, you can send me a one-pager uh, or half-pager, <laughs> just a concept so that we can take a look at these things and review these before you invest your time into writing all the proposal out, uh, which is typically a four or five page document. Okay? Uh, provided that you do this early enough that we can get it into the, a particular cycle. The bottom item that's listed up here is obviously the collaboration marketing side. If you're, if you're teaching circuits, or you're teaching a particular topic, how do you know who to connect with is a good question. How would I know who to connect with at the University of Evansville or Gonzaga or Dayton? Uh, well, we can be the intermediary. So if you have that concept paper, I can help say, well, there, there's these people, and if I don't know, I'll probably contact the principal investigator of the institutional grant and say, who would be the right person? So we've got enough networking, and we can serve that role to, to kind of help you find those other individuals if you don't know them. So the proposals come in on a quarterly basis per our deadlines. The Keen staff, which is comprised of three people, uh, review these and make selections from the set that we receive. We recommend some of those to the board, a subset of those to the board. So there's, it's a two-stage selection process. One is within the Keen staff, the next is at the board level. So at the board level, your, your proposal could get nixed or could get awarded. 
So that's, that's a potential, even though the board you know, puts their trust in the, the program staff to make those selections, but it's still a potential. Okay. Yes? I'll, I'll put that up in just a second. The, the question was about the number of proposals received per, per quarter. Uh, I will say roughly about s somewhere between 15 and 20. Okay. If it's awarded, then there's a grant agreement that, that gets established with typical deliverables. Since this is, um, since the deliverables are very specific, it, it, these are usually very straightforward and much, much easier than an institutional grant. And then the check gets mailed. If it is not selected, then so far I've been able to accommodate video conferences for people that, where they have not been selected. These have been particularly valuable, both with two-way communication, quite frankly. So I learned something from this. I, and hopefully the person on the other end, you know, understands why we didn't select or, or why the award was not made. So we have a process. These slides will make available. We have a point of contact. It turns out to be our executive assistant where these proposals are submitted. And once you submit a proposal, you get an acknowledgement. It should get an acknowledgement. The schedule is the next schedule. The font, yeah, the fonts, okay. Yes, so I, I would be working on this one. So the next, the next uh, cycle for this, the proposal deadline is December 12th. Just so you're, you're aware of the deadline. For that, there's kind of a lot, because of the holidays, there's a long period before the, the uh, award process. And February 4th is the uh, award announcement date. Grant agreements would be about February 21st. So if you're thinking about summer work, if you're thinking about work on a particular quarter, that's how you kind of figure out from, from when the money is available. It's available at the last date, the grant agreement date, when you have to make your proposal. Questions? Ahad? Yes. Can faculty directly submit the proposal or it should go through the institutional BI? The question is, I want to repeat this question very, very clearly <laughs> because this is critical. So your question's perfect. Should the grants be submitted directly to the foundation or should they go through the institution PI? If your institution has an institutional grant, as all of these do here, then they need to be coordinated through the principal investigator. Uh, and that principal investigator's role, in this case, that would be Masood here at Kettering, for example. In your case, it would be Maria Vaz. Yeah, and so you each have a PI at your, for your institutional grant. They become the, the point of contact and the gatekeeper because it's, a, it's essential that that PI knows what's going on and what's being created. They also become, um, uh, they also can, can actually support the process by helping people understand what has to be done with these topical grants and how, how everything works. So involving the PI, the institutional grant PI, is, is an important thing to do. Yes? Just for the sake of Kettering, of course, Mo is the lead person for making sure the proposals have captured what Doug has given us today. So he, he, he knows exactly what needs to go into these things. So he, he will help you. He's, he's a proposal training person. Okay. Any other questions on that? Because that's an important point. I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, Pat. So, we did, so um, to project, you know, forward, is it about every three months after those last dates of, like, I guess, February 12th would be the next uh, proposal deadline? Yeah, it's it's on a quarterly basis. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the dates up there for the the other ones, but but you can you can project that the next one would be about. Our next board meeting is sometime in May, I believe, so you back up a month, basically. Yeah. So. Then the, so then whenever the grant agreement, then you project 12 months after that, that all the um, funds have to be spent by that. Uh, and deliverables uh, submitted. Okay. Yeah. I think yeah. you can petition it differently, right? 
Yes, yeah, and, and there are some cases where uh, extenuating circumstances or something doesn't come together and, and we have no cost extensions and those sorts of things. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So the deliverables are the most important part of these topical grants because that's what you're going to share. That's what becomes a teaching resource. It becomes something that has to be codified, something that has to be in a form that is shareable. Now, typically these come in two flavors. Two flavors are often, um, you know, very specific teaching resources, documents, videos, all sorts of things like that. The other flavor is a little harder to handle. The other flavor is models. So we might, you might say, I would like to develop a model that I would like to share with other institutions. Well, then we have to figure out what are the right deliverables so that people can really work that model. And uh, we do have some of those going on where it's, it's a little bit less of teaching resources. It's more about models. And so what are the documents? They're instructions for, for people that want to pick, pick up this model and actually start using it. And they may have to create their own teaching resources to make it work. But it's a, it's a plan. It's a kit, if you will. So that's the, that's the type that end up. They have to be uploaded to a website. That's kind of the finale. And uh, the grant agreement, the grant agreement as they typically do, contain all the terms and the specifics and the deadlines and so on. And they usually include meetings. So one of the things that, that we have started re realized we needed with these topical grants is about a meeting every three months just to touch base with the people that are working on them. This gets to be a lot of communication for us, me in particular. But I, again, found it very worthwhile to just touch base. And so we'll schedule about a 30-minute meeting, provided an award is made and over the course of the, the development of that. The, the nice, you know, I'll tell you why this has been so good, the meetings, is because somebody will say, well, I'll get some information about one particular award and, and they'll say, well, we're about 50% of the way through. Then we discovered that this company or we discovered this or that. And then when I'm on other meetings with other people, I get to say, you know, you ought to talk to so-and-so. And so it becomes that intermediary role again. Yes. I think this has been really a, a huge refresher for us, the topical grant, the way that have been organizing it. We have two changes in our institution. We had a big one. We have many changes in Douglas, Leading, and Masoud. But we have seen a lot of momentum and energy now with these, with these uh, top of grants. And then uh, people who do it, they really go through do it, and they use it, and uh, we see a lot of changes. So it's had a very, very effect. Good. And what you are doing following it, it's make it even <laughs> yeah, I, and this, that, that is the last bullet that I put up here. The quarterly reports, these, these conversations that we have, they do just move things along. Because as you know, when you have a meeting or when you have a class, you get stuff done. Yeah. At least I do. All right. Acceptance rate. Um, and I know, I see Prim, Prim had to step out. I know many people have class, and the, so you'll see people coming and going. Uh, uh, but now I'll answer his question now that he's away. <laughs> 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 Approximately one third of our submissions get funded. So it's a pretty good hit rate. Uh, and to his question prior, he got some, a partial answer. We get about you know, 15 to 20 currently in topical grants. I think that's going to actually increase. And so uh, we're figuring out how to scale that ourselves. But we also do meet with uh, almost everyone. I put 90% up here, it's rough. We meet with almost everyone that where a grant award was not made and talk, talk through it. And usually it, it's, a, it's a good result. One of the awards that was made here at Kettering was, was rejected the first time through. We met, had conversation. I'm sure conversations continued here at Kettering 
with people around at Kettering, and second time through it was successful. So, um, because this is an old presentation that I'm working off of, this is not updated. This information should say 21 grants are active right now. So we've got 21 topical grants that uh, you can get all the content to, you can get the proposals, everything except the budget. I've decided to keep the budget just as a, as a private matter. Yes, they're all loaded on the, all, the, all of those uh, topical proposals that have been awarded are downloadable at uh, keennetwork.org. I believe there's actually two files, the most recent ones and then the 16 prior ones. So there's a group of five and a group of 16. Okay. So, I'm always asked, can we share some failed proposals also? I've decided at this point not to do that. Uh, I think that's, but to answer the questions, why was my proposal not accepted? That's, I think that's really important. If we, as many of you know, one of the, the, the KSOs, the Keen Student Outcomes, is persist and learn through failure. I take that to heart and, and so I would expect that faculty, if not awarded, would want to learn why and I also take the responsibility of I have to be able to explain exactly why. And so, so I want, it, here are the various reasons that almost always come up in those conversations that we have following, uh, following uh, a potential proposal that was not awarded. So the selected topics don't align with Keen program goals. One of the things that I hope you have, and I brought lots of copies, and this probably accounted for the weight in the bag that I thought was a laptop. Uh, I brought lots of copies of something that's very recent to us called Keen Zine. And this is a publication. We have not, we, we didn't have any leave behind material. And so we had to create something, I thought. And so we decided to create a magazine format that's sort of an evergreen piece. It doesn't have a date on it, as you'll discover. But it says issue one. And we're working now on issue two. And we need some stories, by the way. But issue one, like all issues of Keenzine, will have a collection of stories about why does this program exist, but it also has some things that I'll be referring to in a few moments that are called the Keen Frameworks, where we can point out particular uh, program goals and make sure that things are well aligned with these program goals. So we're using this, and we also have, I brought along with me some, some printed copies of the same Keen Framework information so that we can look at it through the workshop. But that's one of the reasons why a proposal might not be accepted. Uh, or there's a lack, this is the second, these are almost in a hierarchy of, of, of order. The second reason is because I don't know what you're trying to deliver to other people. So the more clarity that you can provide in your deliverables and say we're going to produce a video that, and that maybe you don't want to stop there. Maybe you need to say that video is going to be seven minutes in length and we're going to have four, of, four seven minute videos as opposed to one 30 minute video and it's going to be about this topic. The more specific you can be about the deliverables, the more, the more likely we can uh, 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 look at the proposal with a success. Yes? Regarding the first item one, will you not help us sort of modify the deliverables in the uh, proposal you know, stage? before it is finalized? So what, one thing, with, with a quarterly review process and as much communication that occurs, we, one of the things that I, we have really had to decide to do is that, that the pre-proposal is really only the abstract or one-page form. What I cannot, unfortunately cannot do really at this time, just given bandwidth, is be able to review full proposals 
and have a dialogue about those proposals. So it's kind of like, let's have, provide your one pager, let's have a conversation on the phone, find the examples that have been awarded, and then shoot your best shot. The, the good news is, because it is quarterly, there's lots, there's lots of opportunity. Is that, and, and if, if, by the way, I hope that there's more than just questions. If there's pushback and you say, this doesn't work for me, I wanna hear that too. Because uh, I think the foundation is listening to, to your thoughts. We want to find out how to make this program work. It's not about us being so prescriptive on this process. So market, and sometimes it's need. On occasion, I'll have lots of, uh, lots of proposals about the same topic. Last, last round of proposals, I had one particular topic where I got three proposals, and one got awarded. So you might say, well, are these competitive? Yes and no. We, as we're filling out this library, I might actually need three variations of one particular topic, really. But our timing might dictate, I want to experiment with one first. OK. Um, yeah, we'll do this later. Again, my apologies, because the slides are a little bit mixed, so I've, I've got to. Uh, I've got to jump through something here. All right, how do you hit the bullseye? This is an important part of this uh, conversation. How long do I have? You got to, uh, another... Do I have 15 minutes? You have 30 minutes for the rest of the session. Okay, <laughs> this is about right. This is, the, this is the important part of this besides all the nuts and bolts part. So right now, the, the, what we've done is we've, set, we've tried to be better at articulating what our goals were. We previously, if you've read the Keen uh, paper from 2008 written by Tim Crewall, it's good. It sets the stage, it, it gets the language established, it has uh, described you know, kind of the four goals of the Keen program and the, the four goals of the Keen program have always been and continue to be establish you know, more customer uh, value, understand societal benefits, uh, do this in a way that enters into business and the economy while you are using your technical acumen or technical skills. It's kind of broadening that technical skills. And I can kind of turned it around backwards this time, as sometimes I do. But there's four points that used to be put on this pyramid. You, if you looked at that paper, you'd see that. So we've looked at that and said, that's not enough, <laughs> because it leaves way too much to the imagination. And, and so people went off in different directions, and proposals were not being funded. And then you'd have lots of discussion, and people say, well, what is your framework? So one of the things we've been trying to do over the past year is get a little more articulate on the framework and what we're trying to accomplish. Put it like this, I, I always introduce this skills versus mindset in a variety of different ways. And uh, one way I do it is in terms of um, medical doctors. You could teach a, you could teach a, a surgeon the practice of performing surgery. They could be an excellent technician, but if they didn't have compassion for the human condition or patient care, they might not be all they could be. There are two different things up there. So the one is skills, one is a mindset. And I think these two things, they, they kind of live together, but you, the way I'm looking at this has been very helpful to me to kind of dissect a little bit, sorry to use the medical practice terms, <laughs> but dissect uh, the whole process into two different things, basically these two, two things. So if you practice engineering and business skills and there is this culture of entrepreneurship where people are excited and they're enterprising, they're trying to figure out new ideas, but they also have the skills of understanding what 
uh, some, some terminology might be. They might be able to amortize things. They might be able to figure out a return on investment. They might be able to find new opportunities. And they have skills in this area, but if they practice them in a culture of entrepreneurship, I believe that leads, or is effectively the same as culture, to this entrepreneurial mindset. Entrepreneurial mindset, culture might just be the collective individuals that have entrepreneurial mindset. So this is the way we're looking at this, and we support this with two different documents. The two documents, and they're not showing up. Let me just distribute these to you. I think that might be the best thing to do. Send those out, and I'll send these out. I don't know if I have enough of those. If I don't have enough of the materials, uh, they are all downloadable, and they're all online. All right, so you, some of you, I don't know if I brought enough copies of the magazine. I know some of you have the magazine at this point. Uh, and those who don't, there's an online version of that. It's actually quite a neat flip version, uh, ebook type version of this as well. Just as an advertisement, before we jump back into the material, that magazine has student stories, it has an industry story, it has some faculty stories. I am soliciting uh, you guys for more stories. So I, I would love to, to uh, set, a, set you up with a, um, a writer that basically is writing these articles and he performs the interviews. And if, if you have something that you're doing in your class that, that really is very specific, something that we would love to share, you know, it's, it's submit something to us, and uh, hopefully it will be in issue two. So, Timeline on, on that is uh, December. So we want to have something, we want to have the content budget for the issue two established in mid-December. Okay. All right. So one of the reasons for distributing all the materials right now is so that you had in your hands uh, a copy of the two documents that we're using. And these two documents, one is, resembles the, what we would call skills on the left, and the other resembles what we would call mindset on the right. Now, I have a lot of discussion around whether these are exactly mindset, but we'll get, we'll get to that. I, the skills, I think you'll, you'll tie into. Before you just take a look at that entire suite of all those blocks, I'm going to ask you to just hone in, just uh, take a look at this middle column. There's a column in there that starts with design requirements, and I'm glad we distributed these. You can see them a little bit better. When I ask engineering faculty to describe engineering, this is what I usually get. I get the design cycle. They'll say, well, here engineering is you have to figure out how to solve problems. You start designing something, you have, but first you have to know what the requirements are to design to a spec, and so they often start right there and go down to the bottom of that, which is validating the function of something after creating prototypes. And if you notice, what do we teach? I mean, what do we regard as the foundation for most engineering students? We regard analysis more, more than synthesis, right? That tends to be the case, and there's good reason, good pedagogical reason perhaps for that. So we do a lot of focusing as faculty members on analyzing solutions. I mean, that if you were to color in the blocks and, and say which percentage does a student have most of during their academic path, they'd have a, a pretty heavily colored block on analysis. Maybe even senior design is, uh, you know, that's about the only one that really gets more into the synthesis side. But the point is this. The point is that this is where a lot of people start and stop when we're talking about engineering. A lot of people. Not everyone. More creative people, more creative universities have said, you know, we really want to do a good job of teaching problems. And they do problem-based learning. They, they look at uh, formulating solutions. They kind of pose a problem. And the students have to figure out what resources they might need to solve a problem. So some, I would say, progressive or at least kind of uh, less traditional methods of teaching engineering have, been, have come from problem-based learning. Where did problem-based learning come from? It came from the medical community about 40 years ago. 
Well, and this is a little bit hard to read there, so you've got the charts. Look at this block that says evaluate. You'll see basically the four corners of the pyramid or the four corners of the keen points that I mentioned earlier. Technical, uh, from, from technical, customer, societal, business, they're all kind of captured in there. That point, this, I've had, when I've shown this to industry, I've, t I've taken this into various places and we talk through this because we're trying to get industry partners just as you are and get people to say, does this, does this framework really work? If you hired a student who really understood or had most of these blocks, would you really be interested in that student more than the one that just had the center? Um, I, will, I want you to focus on that block for a second because I do regard that particular block, that's what industry has called out to me a few times. They said, yeah, we really want students who can do this. They can evaluate the technical feasibility of something, but they also understand the customer, they understand some of the business implications around it, and they also even, at a larger sense, understand the societal impact it could have. So, so industry will hot spot. They'll, they'll, they point out this block. They highlight this one when I show them this. But so some, some places have said the build out to increasing the scope of education for engineering is this column. Maybe you even get, in, get into protect, protect intellectual property. Love to have students that had some notion of that. Love to have students that, that could evaluate regulatory issues and have some understanding of the impact of that. So some progressive institutions including yours, all of yours, have kind of worked this direction. But, but honestly, that's not enough to broaden, enough, broaden this off of that centerpiece. It really should include this column on the far left. This, this is really important. I just uh, you know, I sat, I sat down with Mr. Kern, which is a rare opportunity. I sat down with Mr. Kern recently, and we talked about he won't specifically talk about the column and all that, but he talked about the do understanding the opportunities before you dive into projects. And he really was emphatic on the elements that are contained in this left-hand side. Our foundation operates on, on uh, donor intent. And so we'd say, you know, we agree. And I, I actually philosophically completely agree as well. This column is, is a under-emphasized category. Understanding how to identify opportunities. So the past three months for me, I have research projects that I do back at the foundation. The past three months for me has been, have been digging into how to teach opportunity recognition. And there are some pretty good resources out there, actually. And I, I've got some of them. And it's an, it's an area that I, I think we really need to address. And it's one of the areas that I would say a topical grant, if you really want to hit a bullseye, you would include this particular area. And some of that comes from investigating a market. Let me tell you, and some of you know about um, Olin College. Olin's an interesting college. Uh, it's in Needham, Massachusetts. I visited there. I visited, uh, and and uh, people are usually polarized when I mention Olin. They'll say, oh, Olin, because it's so different, and they just throw a bunch of smart kids in a room and they figure it out. Or, or they say, that's really unique and different. Well, think about the second. It is, they do a few things that are really different. There may be something to learn. So one of the things that they do, and this is kind of weird and outside the box, is they'll get the students together. This is one particular activity. Get the students together, and the students will figure out some area that they want to work on. Okay, now it might, be, might not be this, like the solve the world's problems area, but it might be an area that students tend to select. Coffee baristas. I want to solve the problems that coffee baristas have. Okay. <laughs> so what do they do? You, as the student group, you go spend time and you actually, they organize and work and find a way to put you in that environment and you work as a coffee barista. Or you go find out, you know, how does, how does the coffee supply chain work or something. They get very involved and very immersed in this. At the, 
Then they get out of the immersion and they go back and they create these, these uh, diagrams that say uh, there's a relationship between this and this and this supplier and this distributor and the customer is really looking for this and they create all these kind of diagrams. Now does that really produce any, it, does not, it doesn't feel like engineering, you know? It feels more like a business exercise than it does anything else. But it certainly pays off, I believe, in the end. As, as far as framing, you, you can't do this all the time because you've got to teach the students, you've got to teach them statics, you've got to teach them circuits, you've got to teach them the math, they have to have the rigor. But can you inject things like this into an activity that is really engineering focused? And that's where we believe this intersection, this intersection of, of technical and business and opportunity society, all of that kind of is, is, the, is the play where the foundation wants to work. So that left-hand column is all about this. One way to look at opportunities is start looking at markets. One way to look at opportunities is look at the business relationships in a preliminary business model. Now this particular slide does not have a little correction. This should say, I don't know if your copy, does your copy, okay. And that business model is a lot about relationships. What's your value proposition? Who's your customer? Engineers absolutely need to understand that. And then they have to be able to tell you about that. So the next, the column on the right has to do with communicating things in economic terms or communicating them in society, terms of societal benefits and understanding market interest. I bought a, uh, I woke up the other day, this is about three days ago, freezing. Of course, I live in Wisconsin. <laughs> but the thermostat had died. Okay. So I went to buy a thermostat. And I happened to buy this one product, which I'm just terrifically excited about. It's like the iPhone of thermostats. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I can set the thermostat right now with my iPhone. So my wife is home, I can turn it down. <laughs> I, I know that's terrible. But on the box, on the box it says, this thermostat will save you this much money. They presented, even in the advertising, this, now do I believe the claim? Well, we could, regardless. <laughs> this presents, it presents the case in economic terms. And it said, and if you save this, and if you do this, on the other side of the box, it said, and this will save the environment and CO2 footprint, blah, blah, blah. And you go, oh, okay. And it just occurred to me, it's like, they've communicated in terms that are economic, in terms of societal benefits, and when an engineer presents a solution, that's not necessarily the, nat the natural inclination, is it? It's to present the approach. Here's what I did. <laughs> engineer would have said this will control the temperature to plus to minus two degrees Fahrenheit. That's right. And you can dial it on your iPhone. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so communicate this these two orange columns, these are bullseyes for you. In fact you'll see a, a, in a moment here a detail that's on, contained on the printed copy. There's, there's uh, if we added these gray columns on the right, you might say that this is commercialization. In fact, you can take this this way. Sometimes I will edit these things and I'll say, this to me looks like innovation. These blue columns look like innovation. Because you can figure out problems, you can create solutions. You don't have to tell anybody about it. It's still innovation. It can come from your just own your own thought. It doesn't necessarily have to come from any context, and it's still innovation. So those blue columns, to me, represent innovation. These gray columns on the right, rep, to me, represent commercialization because they're all about scaling, building the teams, getting this thing done, getting out to the masses, and so on. And so I look at these two gray columns and say this this has to do with commercialization. Some of the strategies. And I don't know exactly what to call the orange columns, but the whole umbrella 
kind of does cover this entrepreneurial mindset, entrepreneurial thinking. These are competencies. They are teachable. Each one of those blocks is a teachable skill. When this diagram was designed, I tried to think very carefully about, could I teach this in class? Some are more challenging than others, but I think they are teachable. Comments about that? Questions? The bridge, the bridges, the build. Innovation and commercialization, and also from an idea to a final product. I like that. So the oranges may be bridges. I may, I may steal that and use that. <laughs> yeah. Because the innovation hangs off of those two pillars. I mean, if you don't recognize the opportunity, like you said, innovation is just something that came out of your mind. It may have no societal context. Right. So it doesn't hang on anything. I like, I like yeah, that. It's good. And if you don't communicate it out, that bridge goes to nowhere. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. You create it in your basement and it stays there. There you go. I like that. So you'll see on there that there are, there are blocks that identify what we tend to fund and what we do not. The middle column, the one we started with, the assumption we make is everybody does this. Everybody should be doing the design cycle. So where we're pushing is this way and that way. And so things that tend to be funded, and they're not all equally weighted. And the weighting, you know, I don't want to go down on the record saying, well, the weighting's exactly this. The weighting may change, but in general, we're pushing, you know, toward the orange columns, if you will. So these are things you hope the topical grants will emphasize to some level. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the topical grants should start filling in these blocks. In fact, um, I don't know, Pat. Are you going to talk about? Is I don't know the no, the agenda. Right okay. He'll talk about his. Okay. So, so if you don't mind, sure. uh, uh, do you want to say, you know, just talk just very very briefly about your topical grant, and I'll point out the way I looked at it. Sure, I appreciate that. So our goal is to look at how to uh, have our bio training students look at the medical device menu or uh, market and uh, figure out how they can make money. Um, and so uh, I haven't had the benefit of having uh, physicians on campus at all times. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So, Sorry about that. Agree. Sorry about that. So um, my um, uh, class is, is a bioengineering class, and what I've tried to do is take and marshal all the resources available to me to uh, have our bioengineering students make a contribution to the market. And so starting at the left end, uh, identifying opportunities, part of it is uh, you have to understand what the customer wants. And the customer ne not necessarily is, is the patient, it's actually the physician. So I have the benefit of having a physician on campus at all times in my research lab, uh, doing research with me. And so I bring him into class, work with the students to try and generate those ideas, and develop what that value proposition is and who's your customer. That's really the business model they need to start with. And so once that's done, uh, several times throughout the semester they meet with the physician. And I just had this innovation yesterday, I, my grants are approved, but I want to bring one of my uh, machinist from my department in. He is a nuts and bolts farmer who has farmed all of his life and can machine anything in minutes. He can make anything from scratch. And I realized he is also a valuable member of evaluating these ideas. So those are some ideas where you, you, I think you had said 50% through a grant, people say, oh gosh, here's an innovation I want to incorporate. So anyways, you go through that, you, you get your idea, and then um, uh, the issues here about uh, protect intellectual property, they have to draft their own patent. Uh, they then have to learn how the federal government uh, approves medical devices because it affects people's health. And so they have to educate themselves about that and then develop all the paperwork that would then be submitted to the FDA for approval. And so they have to go through those processes and then at the end they have to communicate their idea after it's all done and it's mature back to the physician. The physician is given X number of dollars that he can invest, $1,000. And then he then, based on the ideas, decides where he wants to invest his money. And he, uh, by doing that, he kind of is rank ordering them. And the students also get to vote on what they think was the best idea. Incorporate that all together and you eventually end up with what you think is, is the best ideas. So hopefully that makes sense. That's perfect. And I'll tell you, so the next part of that is when, uh, when we receive that, when we receive that proposal, it's uh, the group looked at this proposal as well as all the others and we said, well, where does this fit into the framework? Because we are using these frameworks. It's not just throwing the frameworks out there and saying, uh, you know, 
we like these ideas, we're using these to, for a proposal process as we should. So the, the whole process that, that Pat described with a physician coming in and, and looking, uh, kind of investing, if you will, in, in a sense, in certain types of work, you know, put the students in this position of seeking opportunity. And so we said, yeah, there, there's a, if we were to highlight that block, that one comes out, gets emphasized. And the other part that came out of that was, had to do with uh, intellectual property on there and looking at that. But particularly, the thing that, that particularly played well in this instance had to do with regulatory um, concerns. I, I even remember one piece of that proposal that talked about uh, if, you, if you're a designer of, uh, uh, of materials that might be put in a knee or, or put, it, put in so, some sort of uh, uh, implanted device, would you build this out of uh, titanium alloy? Would you build it out of magnesium? And the, the comment that the proposal made, I think, this is paraphrasing, uh, the students, you know, generally don't know the implications of that. They know the strength of materials, they know the technical side, but there's another dimension to this. If they designed it out of titanium alloy, am I getting this right? Absolutely. If they designed it out of titanium alloy, then that it's well understood of the, if the effects in the body. If they designed it out of magnesium, it's not necessarily that it's bad, but it's not well understood, which could delay uh, FDA approval. And if a startup company or something like that has delays on FDA approval and there's cash flow issues, this is, this is expounding a little bit on that, that can be, that can be a death valley for, for those companies. So, just to yes. Clarify, when that titanium alloy, you can be uh, in business in 60 days with titanium alloy. It's same implant, let's just say a fracture plate or whatever happens to be to repair somebody's bone, made out of magnesium. The number we use, if it's not already a, a well understood material, is, is kind of a rule of thumb 10 years, $100 million. That's the number we use. Okay. Uh, there's no basis to that. But you realize 60 days versus, and, and virtually no money, because it's already well understood, versus the other. It, it's a big showstopper. So the idea of the grant was to purposefully not tell them about some of these issues, let them design however they want, and then put this requirement in front of them and see how many of their designs are now completely have to start over from scratch. Yes, and in fact, that progressive disclosure can be uh, very valuable in an educational environment, and I'm seeing that used more and more at Keene schools. So, so there's a, an example where we said, okay, that hot spot's that, that, and that. You don't try to hit every one of these blocks, and perhaps that's the point to make as we're talking through this example. You don't try to hit every one of these blocks. You, we're trying to fill this, this in with the right material. And the assumption is that as a student goes through their academic process, hopefully they'll acquire, in a shotgun approach, content all over the place. Yeah. But we're coming up on our break. How much more time do you need? Um, you can stop me at any time. I don't want to. <laughs> I tell you what, I will, I will make quick work of the next two or three slides and we'll take a break. Okay. Because this is the appropriate time to make a quick change. The quick change is those are the skills and competencies that I believe are directly teachable. There's another set of things that I don't believe are directly teachable. This is just, some, some people would argue, but I would say I don't, I don't know of any ethics classes that a student ever took that made them necessarily more ethical. <laughs> but they might understand the, the core fundamental logic of ethics, but it doesn't make them more ethical. The eth so this mindset portion is, is an aspect that, that I think is the less teachable and more cultural. <laughs> Okay, so the focus on topical grants tends to be less on the mindset activities. Now, there's a challenge, Masood has pointed this out, other people have pointed this out. They say, well, your, your goal is to develop a mindset. Why don't we teach the, exactly those aspects toward that mindset? It's a real challenge, I believe, just some of the topics that are there. I I think we are probably better off teaching skills and competencies, but you have to wrap mindset in that somehow. It has to be somewhere in this proposal. And I, 
I am cha always challenged with that, I'll just admit that. But the mindset process is another document. You have it in your magazine. Some of you may have an actual paper copy that, that has a, a, like a two-fold thing. And it starts on the left-hand side uh, with the key phrase. The key phrase here, it's, it would be in the magazine, it's probably pages uh, 10 and 11. Okay. The key phrase on the left-hand side of this is that entrepreneurial mindset coupled with engineering thought and action expressed through professional skills and founded on character. That's what we're really looking for. That's like the phrase, that's the building, if you will, of, of the kind of icing on the cake to the foundation. And so each one of these is embodied with a few phrases that we try to capture this. And we're trying to build these things out so that it's not just one document, so that it's actually, and, but we're not building these out of the foundation. We're asking the keen faculty members to build these out with some detail. So with, but at a skeletal level, it's enterprising attitude, multidimensional problem solving, collaboration, communication, and integrity. It's hard to teach integrity, for example. But the aspirational goals are all captured in the words that you find on the right. I'm going to point out just a few of those. They don't stick out on the page. You might make a check mark by these because there are some that are more salient than others. And, and they fall into, if you start looking at the things that are on here, if you start with, uh, Everybody, if you were to go from here down, you could say this is a leadership program. You could say all sorts of things. You know, it, do, it doesn't really stand out as being different than, than a lot of programs because, of course, people call for ethical practices. You know, IEEE and, and other organizations have, have codes of ethical practice and so on. So you could look at these down and say, well, this is foundational. This has to be there or you can't build anything on top of it. So you might look at that. You might add on this layer on top of the cake here that, that has really more to do with engineering, but it's not really analysis focused. Uh, I mean, it's being able to be creative and also system think about things. So it's kind of some particular things about engineering. But the top part is really the icing on the cake. That's what differentiates the Keen program from a lot of other things out there. That's why it's the lead, the entrepreneurial mindset, enterprising attitude. Here's the most salient stuff. Hopefully that shows up. Let's see. There it is. So if we were to build a dashboard that had three dials on it, you know, your gas gauge and your odometer and your speedometer. The things we would be most concerned about are probably these lines. You need the rest of the car, but you need these things. What if you had a student who you could really identify that they, they are able to, to uh, create value when they're faced with problems? You know those people. And what if you had somebody that really had a future look on things and they anticipated technical developments by understanding what's going on around them, the world around them? They, they say, oh, look at the energy crisis and we're fracking and then we're starting to export natural gas. What does that mean for exactly what I do in my job and the technical developments that might surround that? That's kicker. If you've got somebody that can do that and and there's a way to kind of hone that mindset and develop it, let's do it. And the last one uh, has to do with the four corners that I've mentioned before, which are technical, economic, business, customer. So the idea is to, to be aware of the, uh, the effect or influences of what's going on and then come up with some maybe solutions for <clears throat> Yeah, um, I'll, I'll share with you some uh, exercise we're going to do at our winter conference. I know everyone's not going, uh, uh, and we have a break, so I'm, I'll, but I'll be really brief. Um, 
the, one of the things that we're going to do at our winter conference is something, an exercise I learned from somebody else, from a faculty member who would have their students, they, the, all the students received the New York Times. That was just part of the school's process. And then the students would look at the New York Times and they, would, they were asked to read the first two pages and find the engineering and science problems on them. And obviously they don't stick out, okay? And so it might be an earthquake. It might be this or that in business. And you find the engineering and science problems in that, two things happen. First of all, the students understand what's going on in the world <laughs> because they're reading the newspaper. Second, they're trying to figure out how do I just quickly, and you know, that, this is not a big exercise. This is a 30 minute exercise or less. And, and so suddenly uh, you're, you're kind of whetting their appetite. Some of them would see, see this as kind of punitive, perhaps, <laughs> but, but you, are, you can get students engaged in understanding the world around, around them rather than just fo so narrowly focused. It's kind of like that coffee barista thing that I described. All right, uh, that is, uh, let's stop right there and, and follow your agenda. <laughs>